Get Rich Education is brought to you by Refoil and Gas Companies, partners in American energy production for world consumption. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else, and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. Welcome to the Get Rich Education Podcast, show 13. I am your host, Keith Weinhold. We're talking technology today, both how it will affect your life and how it will affect you as an investor and a real estate investor. Yeah, and real estate is the investment that has made more people wealthy than anything else. So technological change and how it affects real estate causes big ripples in the investor world. At least three disruptive technologies all promise to have a great impact on your everyday life these next 10 years, and you need to think about how that affects you and your investing. Namely, 3D printing, drones, and driverless cars are the three technologies I'm talking about, and they all plan to disrupt real estate, some for the better, some for the worse. You know, people lead reactive lives, not proactive lives, so Congratulations for being here. You're being proactive and technology changes a lot in our lives. And you know, really, sometimes it's easy to forget. Remember around the year 2000, it was common to ask the question whether one had the internet at home or not. You know, what about that same time? Remember people asking each other if they did their banking online? Do you remember that? There was a significant subset of people then that considered online banking something that was risky. And that all went away pretty fast. It's even kind of easy to forget now. When's the last time that you had to use a bank teller? You know, for most of you, it's probably been a while. Think back in the 1990s, experts predicted that in 10 years, people would have computers in their pockets, and some people scoffed at that notion. Well, it happened pretty fast. It's been true for me ever since I was one of the first people I knew to have an iPhone back in 2008. Now it's kind of unusual if a person doesn't have a phone with apps in their pocket at nearly all times. Well, technology changes real estate too. Of those three technological disruptors, 3D printing, drones, and driverless cars, today I'm going to focus on how driverless cars affect you and your real estate investing. A driverless car is an automated robotic type of vehicle that travels from one destination to another without any human operator. Now, national real estate associations and lobby might not want to talk about something like this. Oftentimes, they want to put a happy face on all real estate telling you it's always a good time to buy everything. Well, I'll share evidence today to show you why that's not true. And I do just want to credit, this is partly based on a report by the National Real Estate Advisors titled, The Coming Driverless Car and Its Impact on Real Estate, NECANET.org. Real estate has always been about location, 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 but locations change over time and technological change can have a huge impact on real estate. Just breaking down a little history here. Railroads dominated back in the 1800s. That's how people got around for longer range transportation. That's how goods were primarily transported. I mean, I live in a city of over 300,000 people today that sprang up because it was a railroad terminus, Anchorage, Alaska. In the 1900s, that was the century of the automobiles, and that allowed for suburban sprawl, and cities were based around the advent and the use of the automobile. Later in the 1900s, you had air conditioning that allowed for the development of the South and more people moving to the Southwest, and and they could live so comfortably with affordable air conditioning. And kind of in the mid-1900s, jet planes revolutionized travel and changed a lot of things. And then we have telecommuting. And the next thing may very well be driverless cars in how they change society and resultantly the real estate that you interact with every day. With part of this history, let's take a look back at a very brief history of New York City and the rise of New York. 
In 1800, its population was about 60,000 people. Just 10 years later, New York became the most populous city in the U.S. Ten years later, in 1820, the first regularly scheduled bus service was instituted in New York. It was horse-powered. Yeah, it was horse-powered. Well, in 1832, the first streetcar line was completed, running from downtown to Harlem. That was horse-powered. In 1860, the New York City population surpassed 1 million, and horses were still the main way to get around. In the late 1800s, massive numbers of immigrants came in and swelled New York City's population even further, so that by 1900, New York was the second most populated city in the world. But New York had a problem. They still had horses. So by 1900, the human population was 3.5 million, but New York's horse population was 200,000. 200,000 horses in New York. Horses were used for everything there. Trucking, buses, trolleys, deliveries, snow removal, garbage removal. But there was one big problem, and that was the horse manure in an urban environment. Each horse produced 24 pounds of manure per day, one and a half pounds per person, and there wasn't any systematic street cleaning. Manure piles lined the streets of New York and ended up getting plowed and piled in vacant lots in the horse district. So by 1908, horse-drawn carts were used to remove the snow in Manhattan, and uh, things got even worse. With horse carcasses, the average lifespan for a workhorse was two and a half years. It was actually more profitable to work a horse to death than it was to extend its life beyond those two and a half years. Well, carcasses were often abandoned in the streets, and in 1880 alone, New York City was forced to remove 15,000 abandoned horse carcasses from the streets. I mean, you can see photos of New York City from the early 1900s of children playing in the streets with dead horse carcasses next to them. So New York wondered what to do, what to do about this problem. And in 1898, the first International Urban Planning Conference was held in New York, and the whole topic was what to do about manure. And the conference was abandoned after only three days because no one had any viable ideas of what to do. So people have long wanted to live in the suburbs back then, but it was rarely an affordable thing to do. Well, a lot of that began to change in 1908 when Henry Ford introduced the Model T. And just six years later in 1914, Ford began to use the assembly line so that the Model T could become affordable to the masses. It cost four months of a worker's pay in order to get a car. So there was some affordability there. Well, that just ballooned the number of cars that Americans were owning, such that by 1953, the U.S. had one car per household. And just three years later, in 1956, the interstate highway system was authorized and major changes were on the way. That's when you saw the rise of the suburbs. And that reflected in a lot of cultural changes. There was more of a focus on the individual, and that's when cities began to be designed around cars. So there was no longer the problem with the manure because we didn't have the horses, but then you had new pollution and environmental impacts. Culturally, the household size dropped from almost five people in 1900 to just over three people in 1960. People were more spread out. Every family all of a sudden needed their own house, their own yard, their own swimming pool. And they could do that because the car enabled them to be more spread out. Every person needed their own car, TV, and phone, too. It was the era of the individual. And here's where we start getting into how the advent of car culture affected real estate. That's when we had to have parking lots. That's when we had to have parking garages. That's when we had to have more and wider roads. So shooting ahead for a moment so you can see where I'm going, that's also how the dismantling of all this parking and all these more wider roads will be the result of a proliferation of driverless cars. Okay, so stepping back, adapting the world to cars. Some laws formed. The first minimum parking requirements by cities were introduced in the 1920s, and they became pretty widespread by the 50s. Almost every jurisdiction in the U.S. requires a minimum amount of parking for any new construction, any type of construction. The area in the U.S. covered by parking spaces is now estimated to be larger than Rhode Island, Delaware, Vermont, and Connecticut combined. I mean, Disneyland's parking lot alone is one of several in the world with space for over 
10,000 cars. So the result of all this is that there are over 1 billion parking spaces in the United States. That's eight parking spaces out there for every car that exists. Think of what a waste that is. What a poor use of space, of real estate, that is. Your car can only be parked in one of those eight spots for it at a time. If it's parked in your garage, it's not parked in the unoccupied space built for it at the other seven places, like your work and the supermarket and the gym, or even the space allocated for it to be on the road. So resultantly, today in 2015, we have cities that have just been taken over by cars. Washington, D.C. is 44% streets and parking, and it's 51% buildings. I guess the remainder to make up the 100% is park and water and other things. Well, in Milwaukee, the effect's even greater. That city is 54% parking and streets. Little Rock, Arkansas, 62% parking and streets. Houston, Texas, are you ready for this? 65%, nearly two-thirds of the city, is occupied by parking and streets. Yeah, cities have truly been taken over by cars. That's a lot of real estate being occupied by cars. Some of the consequences of this runaway car culture have been increased pollution. Some cities, like Shanghai, have auto emissions that put so much particulate into the air that they've been recorded up to 25 times what experts consider safe. Uh, my wife and I experienced some of that a year ago in the Philippines when we could only see the hazy outline of the Manila skyline in a really hazy fashion while we stayed just a couple miles away right there in Metro Quezon City. All these cars lead to a lot of impervious surfaces, surfaces that water can't run through, and that causes a lot of problems with storm water runoff. Let's go ahead and look at the case of um, Legacy Village. It's a suburban shopping center outside Cleveland, Ohio. It was built about 12 years ago in 2003. Its retail shopping area is 11 acres. Its parking area is an additional 50 acres. Well, the shopping portion itself is only 17% of the entire center. So even with the 2,600 parking spaces there, its future growth is constrained by the current limited parking. Parking is too crowded during the holidays, and additional development is on hold until they solve the parking problem. Well, you know what? I think technology is going to do that for them first. Let's look at the five-year ownership cost of a Ford Fusion, a modest car. That cost over five years is $47,000 when you factor in the cost of the car, the taxes, the fees, the fuel, the insurance, the maintenance. Well, with the way that people are beginning to use cars today, their cost is less than half of that over five years with these ride-sharing services. But the number of cars per household already did peak a few years ago, and it's been on the way down. Services like Uber and Lyft, these ride-sharing services, could keep that snowball going down for less and less car ownership, and they could make that snowball roll down faster. Driverless cars could really help make that accelerate. You might have used an Uber ride yourself by now. You use your phone to reserve a car, and it uses GPS coordinates to come pick you up at your location. The car is owned by someone else, and that someone else is just like you, and you're paying them to borrow the car. They pick you up. It's not quite a taxi. Rather than that Uber car being parked in someone's garage or their work parking lot, it's in use instead. It's not occupying a parking spot. It's reducing demand for parking spots. Well, driverless cars are taking that one step further. And there is a radical change on the way both in how you live every day, for the better, and also what's going to happen to real estate values when there are all of these unused parking spaces. There are also going to be narrower roads and streets. Right, think about an urban street. You have a lot of different configurations. I know of inner city one-way streets in Philadelphia in D.C., that have parking on both sides of the street, all right? You have a one-way lane of traffic in the middle, parking on both sides, so there's only one moving traffic lane between the two parked cars on either side. Well, if you eliminate the need for parking in the spaces in front of those buildings that were previously occupied by parked cars, you know, that can now be sidewalk or green space or 
You could expand the building size to occupy that unused space. You can repurpose it a lot of different ways. Right now, on average, people spend one to two hours driving each day. That means your car is parked somewhere 22 to 23 hours per day. Well, some predict that Google's driverless car will be for sale in 2018. I mean, that's three years away. One was already driven from downtown San Francisco along Highway 1 to L.A. without any human intervention. That's Google. Test the plans to be 90% driverless in just one to two years. I, I don't know whether they're going to be able to do that or not, but most every major car manufacturer has a driverless prototype now. And the major consensus of big auto is that driverless cars will be for sale to the public by 2020. That's not far away at all. There are still a few technological hang-ups that driverless cars need to overcome. They can currently be kind of jerky and clumsy in city traffic. They don't operate very well in the rain. The vehicle communication still needs to be refined somewhat, but this is all actively being worked on by major auto manufacturers. There are still some legal issues to have to be worked out too, especially with who exactly is liable in an accident if there's no driver in the car. One important hurdle, like any new technology, it has to win the larger public trust before it is adopted, sort of like online banking needed to be 15 years ago. But this is happening. It's not so much that it might in the future. I mean, this is happening. On an experimental basis, there are already four U.S. states that allow driverless cars to be on the road. Yes, driverless cars can legally be driving right next to you right now in California, Nevada, Michigan, and Florida. Let's look at how quickly this might be adopted among the mainstream. Let's look at the period of time it took for some of these other inventions to move from a 10% adoption rate up to a 50% adoption rate. That's the time period from when you've got a few early adopters all the way up to the tipping point of 50% and just over that where most of society owns and uses these inventions. For an older invention like the telephone, it took 39 years, 39 years for it to go from 10% adoption to 50%. The car, eight years. The cell phone, six years. Internet, five years. Basically, as time goes on, new technology gets adopted faster. Driverless cars could, could be adopted rather quickly, especially when you consider that this is an invention that can significantly diminish or eradicate one of the leading causes of death, traffic accidents. You can't even say that about those other inventions I just mentioned. Those earlier inventions like the car, the phone, they didn't have the substantial and sort of overt promise of greater safety like the driverless car invention does. In this safety conscious world, people could adapt driverless cars quite quickly once they're street legal uh, to the public. So be nimble, be educated, this could change fast. It's been estimated that at a 90% adoption rate, each year, driverless cars could save 22,000 lives, 2.8 billion hours of time, and $355 billion. That's just in the U.S. It's also estimated to mean 43% fewer vehicles, though each vehicle would be in use more. You're going to have new free time. That's the good news for you. While your car is doing the driving, you can sleep, relax, work, watch TV, socialize more easily with others. I mean, you're gaining productive time. Let's just take a look at what a future family routine could look like during a workday. All right, you got a family with a typical workday. At 7 a.m., the car leaves and takes one parent to work. Well, by 8 a.m., the car arrives back home, driverless, and picks up the children and the other parent and goes to school and the second workplace for the other parent. Oh, by 10 a.m., the car takes itself to the repair shop. By 3 p.m., the car goes to school, picks up the children, drops off one at soccer practice and one at their piano lesson. At 5 p.m., the car picks up everybody on the way home for dinner together. I mean, that could revolutionize the typical day for the family. Let's take a look at a weekend scenario. What a weekend might look like for a family. 6 p.m. on a Friday, 
the driverless car picks up the parents and then picks up the children in New York City and they're all in the driverless car as it transports them overnight Friday night slash Saturday morning so that at 9 a.m. Saturday morning the family arrives all rested and fresh in Chicago and the family spends Saturday and Sunday visiting the grandparents in Chicago at 4 p.m. Sunday the family leaves Chicago and by 7 a.m. the next morning Monday the family arrives home they're all ready to get ready to go to work. They rested all night. They just slept in the car. So a car can just drop you off at your location and not have to occupy a parking space. Once it drops you off, it can just drive away on its own to pick up someone else. Everyone just rents a car that fits their needs as needed and when needed. Also, every time you rent a car, you can just rent the car that you need. Are you moving some big items? Go ahead and rent a pickup truck for the afternoon rent a sleeper car for a vacation. If you're into exercise, you can rent an RV-like vehicle, and while you're commuting, you can be listening to a podcast while you're running on the treadmill while you're commuting in an RV. I mean, just try to get your mind around that. Yeah. Consider that now the elderly and the handicapped are going to have the convenient mobility to get to places they couldn't travel to previously. What about those that are under 16? They no longer need a driver license. They can just go. Parents don't need to be chauffeurs anymore. Technology is great and it's only going to get better. So what's that mean for your general investing and for your real estate investing? For one thing, being invested in the far suburbs of a city could be more lucrative. Those properties may become substantially more valuable. At the same time, some things could be falling out of favor, like parking lots, parking garages, single-family homes that have large garages, apartment buildings with carports, and convenience stores could too. More on that when we return on Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinholt. Are you looking for an investment with the potential to offer monthly cash flow and tax advantages? While prices fall at the pump, now could be the time to invest in oil and gas. In business for nearly 30 years, Reef Oil and Gas Companies has endured price fluctuations and understands the importance of creating opportunities by purchasing oil and gas properties during distressed times. Primarily focused on the Bakken Three Forks of North Dakota and the Eagleford Channel of South Central Texas, Reef's model is designed to generate revenue and provide tax advantages from the production of oil and natural gas. For more information on this investment opportunity, go to reefogc.com. Welcome back. Hey, about that investment opportunity, Reef Oil and Gas Company CEO Mike Maselli is planning to appear here on GRE. I expect to ask him more detail about that investment for you, including about their environmental impact and how the sharply lower oil prices might benefit a reef investor in a buy low and sell high sort of way. I can tell you that I've been a reef investor for three years now, and they've provided me with 36 consecutive monthly cash flow checks hassle-free, so I've been pretty happy. I've also got two very close investor friends that have had the same experience. So that's reefogc.com. It's reef and the letters OGC, as in reef oil and gas companies. So these driverless cars that you're likely only going to hear more and more about, their technology gives them the advantage of driving closer together. They're more precise. They can drive closer together both side by side, and they also won't need to leave as much following distance behind the car in front of them. Because of this greater precision, now the lane widths can be substantially more narrow. There's less of this sort of waving around within the lane that there is with a human driver. This all leads to less traffic, smaller highways, and more real estate that will be repurposed because it won't need to be occupied by cars. Driverless cars could also mean the demise of convenience stores. 85% of convenience stores have gas pumps. The advent of credit cards at the pump almost a generation ago, that already reduced foot traffic and sales income inside convenience stores. 
Well, the cars are still going to need gas, but if the drivers aren't even going to go to the gas pumps anymore because the car is going to do it for them, there'll be virtually zero customers enticed into convenience stores. So that may not be the type of retail real estate that you would want to invest in. Or then again, perhaps it is, and you just want to be sure that you get the timing right when it comes to buying a convenience store. What do I mean there? Convenience stores often occupy major intersections and busy corners. Once the demise of convenience stores comes to fruition and they go on sale, that could be a huge redevelopment opportunity for you. You got to think about transit-oriented development like subways, uh, urban elevated trains, and trolley lines. Currently in urban areas, it is deemed as desirable to own property close to that amenity of transit. Over a recent five-year period in Boston, there is a case study of homes near transit that increased in value 130% and homes away from transit decreased in value by 45%. So if driverless car sharing becomes widespread, it could be much less desirable to have real estate located near transit centers. You can get a driverless car into a tighter urban area. Parking places are no longer needed. There's less fear about getting stuck in traffic because you can do a lot of what you want to do inside a driverless car when you're inside your own private cocoon. Also in urban areas, it's been estimated that one third of traffic is just driving around looking for a parking spot. So you could have substantially less traffic in urban areas. So what happens to public transportation? Well, you've got private cars. Currently, you've got private cars which give you privacy and flexibility when you use your own car, but you better not text while driving when you're doing that. Now, on a bus or a train, it's kind of convenient because you can catch up with news or you can be texting your friends, but then you're surrounded by strangers and you're on someone else's schedule. Well, driverless vehicles could be viewed as the best of both worlds. You've got privacy and you don't have to keep your eye on the road. Would there be any point then to investing in public transportation itself or the real estate next to public transportation? I mean, you've got to wonder. It's going to be an increasingly valid question. You've also got to ask, do you even want to be invested in traditional car companies over the long term or at least in the same way? Cars are going to lose their importance as a status symbol. When people don't own cars and they're just sharing whatever nearly anonymous driverless car It matters little with how they look. So more obviously, you've got to wonder that what's going on and what's that going to do to taxi and driving jobs? Sharing services like Uber and Lyft have already begun to erode that. With the advent of driverless cars, inner cities could be less desirable to invest in for a couple reasons. They'll have the opportunity to expand out into all those now unused parking spots, more supply, It'll also be less problematic to live way out in the far suburbs and exurbs because you can sleep, work, or play while the car is driving. That might put more demand, therefore higher real estate values, on those properties that are currently far outside of metro central business districts. But you may just be repurposing the garage in that outlying property because there are fewer reasons than ever to own and park a car there. Driverless cars will have a dramatic effect on real estate usage and values. So just be mindful that change in society can occur fast and it can be adopted fast. We've seen it happen before. In the 1800s, we had a horse culture. Horses were the companion of the wagon train, the cavalryman, the settler, the cowboy. Horses were everywhere. Even if you lived in a big city where people traveled by carriage, and goods were delivered by horse-drawn wagons, most every American knew some of the basics of horsemanship. It sounds crazy today, but people knew how to mount a horse, win the trust of a horse, command and steer a horse, reshoe a horse if it needed to. I mean, it's easy to laugh, but it's true. That's the world we lived in then. And today, horsemanship is the province of the very wealthy, the very rural, and those who make a living dealing with horses. I mean, that's alien to most Americans. But in time, the same is going to be true of car culture. And the wealthy people are going to race on private tracks. But the rest of us are going to be escorted around by these machines with really no thought to how to drive them. It will likely happen. 
I mean, look, ships have been using a self-steering gear since the 1950s. The first autopiloting of an airplane took place a hundred years ago. Yeah, can you believe that? So it's totally comprehensible that driverless cars could have significant adoption, maybe even as early as 2020, just five years away. So when you invest, you've got to begin with the end in mind. Ask yourself, what's my exit strategy at the end when I want to sell or repurpose this property? Driverless cars aren't going to revolutionize transportation and real estate like next week or next month, but passive buy and hold real estate investors don't buy to hold for only a week or a month. If you buy and hold and then you want to sell for a nice gain, say in eight years, if driverless car adoption is even eminent by that time, you might not have a nice gain in eight years if you buy the asset class that technology is making fall out of favor or that's becoming apparent to people. Now, if you buy in a more outlying area and driverless cars really did create more demand for that outlying property than what existed in today's era, then you would potentially have a much nicer gain. You might buy and do well with cash flow now. Just keep in mind that when you sell, you've got to wonder who your buyer is going to be and what kind of world we're going to live in then. So there's some fascinating technologies out there. In the future, we'll likely have a show on how 3D printing and also how drones affect your lives and your investor lives. So be aware and go out there and refine your investing strategy accordingly. And don't quit your day dream. You've been listening to the Get Rich Education podcast, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to visit iTunes and leave your comments. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively.